Your drive must have been through the tunnel to come into the house of the Lord. Anyway, I want to say what's up to everybody. Um, we're continuing a series of talks today. Actually, we're, we're ending a series of talks uh, that we've called Sidekicks. And throughout this series, we've examined the lives of some characters that we meet in Scripture. Um, and I'm pumped, you know, like this is, this is typical pastorism, so I'm sorry. But I can't wait to tell you what we're going to talk about next week, you know, that, that thing. Um, we actually have, um, again, by, by the miracle of broadcast, um, Man of Churches. Again, we're a family of churches. Uh, we have this crazy vision to plant 273 churches near every U.S. military installation. And we're already in 23 of those locations. Um, so what we're going to do is we're actually going to hear from a longtime member of the Mana family, retired General Major Kurt Fuller. Um, and what we're going to hear from him is just a little bit of his story. I mean, there, there were some close calls as we take a moment to, to experience Memorial Day together. Um, because you don't live in a city like ours or be a part of a church like ours and Memorial Day not hit home. Um, so I think it's going to be amazing to glean uh, from this major general uh, as he shares some of his experience leading conventional forces, but also what he did in the special operations community. So super pumped to jump into that next week. But like I said, I'm not General Fuller. My career has not been that amazing. But um, I, I can identify with being a sidekick, um, you know, like your average everyday man, or in the case that we've studied for this series, average everyday woman, um, who is behind the scenes, um, again, just being obedient to God, using what is available in their hands in order to be a resource for the kingdom, kingdom to advance God's agenda here on the earth. Because I don't readily identify with um, parting the Red Sea or, um, I don't know, walking on water or, um, I, I never preached a sermon. Again, I, I'm, I'm, Troy, I'm looking forward to this day. Um, that I preach a sermon and thousands of people get saved. Yeah, that, that's Peter. <laughs> that's Peter. I mean, these folks are heroes in Scripture. I just want to experience those moments. I'm talking about legends like the one, the only. I mean, you're, you're going to miss him at the end of the series, I promise. We may have to bring Chuck back. Chuck Norris, can we put, oh my goodness. Ah, yes. He, he deserves an applause. In fact, I actually want to show you a quick father-son photo. We can get this next image up here. Um, fun fact, the Total Gym is a child of Chuck Norris. So in case you want to get in shape, we got the Total Gym available for you. I'm sure there's a 1-800 number that you can call and make six easy payments and get <laughs> one of those. Here's a fun fact. Chuck Norris doesn't need to throw out the trash. It throws itself out out of fear. So again, that's household chores in the Norris home. Now, when I grew up, uh, again, I'm an 80s baby, uh, raised in the 90s, so uh, we had these amazing books called Where's Waldo? Um, anyone familiar with these books? Man, I, I, I've searched, I mean, scanned these books for hours upon hours. Like, you get one page, and it's like, really, everyone has on blue jeans and a red and white shirt? Like, <laughs> how am I going to find him? Through my research, I found out that Waldo's actually hiding from Chuck Norris. <laughs> Never knew. Never New Chuck Norris plays dodgeball, and when he does, the balls dodge him. So I think he never loses. I mean, it must be nice to be Chuck. And again, like I said, I'm an 80s baby. Uh, discovered this. Chuck Norris can actually touch MC Hammer. <laughs> what, what a guy. And last but certainly not least, <laughs> I'm going to end your suffering, church. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Chuck Norris once had a heart attack. His heart lost. So just... <laughs> Fun facts about Chuck as we dive back into our character study for today. Um, our Mary for today is actually a lady named Miriam. Um, and I know you're like, hey, this is a bait and switch. You told me they were all going to be named Mary. Well, that's what I thought until I started studying and I discovered that Miriam is actually the Hebrew version of the name Mary. Um, so like my name is Riley. I don't know how to translate that into any other language, but my middle name, thanks mom, is Pierre. Um, <laughs> Peter would have been a good choice if it would have felt a little less French. A little less <laughs> um, but yeah, there, there, there's also Pedro. I mean, there are other good options out there. So Miriam is the Hebrew version of the name Mary. And I can't wait to share her story with you um, because there's a whole gamut that she can teach us. Um, from watching her as a, a young teenage girl to, to later serving with her brothers and leading God's people. We're going to see that. And there's a tremendous amount of character study that we can do from her in scripture. But what I've noticed is that her narrative tends to be overshadowed by her brothers, um, Aaron and, and Moses. So those are her siblings. And particularly, again, we're going to examine this first story here. We meet Miriam in the midst 
of her brother Moses' story. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, we're going to spend a lot of time in Exodus today. Uh, but if you don't, our team is so amazing. Um, they actually put all of the things I plan to say and some of the things that I don't, like Chuck Norris. Um, they throw all that on the wall so you don't have to worry about missing a thing. So let's go to Exodus chapter 2. Um, we'll look at these 10 verses. Verse 1 says, Now a man from the house of Levi, again, that's his family, that's his tribe. These are people who look like him, same culture. A man from the house of Levi and took as his wife a Levite woman. So, you know, keep it in the family. Like, we know each other. This is common. This is how our people intermarry. This is how we get down. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. When she could no longer hide him, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and dubbed and bitmen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the riverbank. And his sister, the child, the baby, stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. Thus, we meet our sidekick for today, Miriam. And a little bit of context. Um, God's people, um, the, the, the Hebrews, the children of Israel, they are slaves in Egypt. Um, so that, that's where, you know, they, they, they fled during a time of famine and things were good because one of their people was in charge. That was Joseph. And then time passes and the, the, the Egyptians are like, who's Joseph? Like, we don't know him no more. So now y'all are going to be put to forced labor. This is going to be great for the economy. So that's what's happening to God's people in this context. And because they're thriving while in captivity, um, their numbers are growing, and the Egyptians feel threatened by this. So now we've got to control the numbers, because otherwise they may decide to rebel and overthrow us from power. So there's been a call to genocide, um, to terminate all the Hebrew males age three and under. Um, thus Moses is born in peril, and that's why his mom was trying to hide him. And then I look at this girl um, who is standing by the banks of the river. And this ain't the James River. Um, this, this is in Egypt. This is the Nile River, um, where there are these creatures called crocodiles. Uh, I don't know about you, but you wouldn't find me walking by the reeds trying to see where this basket is going to go. Like, you could be eaten that day. Like, I, I don't know if crocodiles like Hebrew people, uh, but I imagine that she would have been on the menu if she stepped into the wrong space. And so she's following this basket with her little brother in it, and she wants to make sure it's okay. And I'm thinking, like, again, is this thing airtight? I mean, I know we got some, some folks who are naval. That's why I wore my shirt with the anchors to, to represent you guys today. Like, I, I don't know if this thing is watertight, if it's sealed. I mean, is it seaworthy to navigate the Nile River? Or what if it flips? I mean, some rivers have waves. So what if this basket flips over? What if there's a predator? So again, there, there's these crocodiles, all these animals that could have threatened the life of Moses. What's worse? What if an Egyptian actually finds this basket? Because the Egyptians are the ones who are exterminating God's people, their children. And of course... That's exactly what happens. Look at verse 5. Now the daughter of Pharaoh, um, so again, first family. Um, so she is the second most powerful woman. Assuming Pharaoh's married, then she would have been the queen. So this princess came down to bathe at the river while her young women, so she had some servants, walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman, and she took it. When she opened it up, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. She, Pharaoh's daughter, took pity on him and said, this is, this is one of the Hebrews' children. Again, it's easy to identify because there's a clash of culture here. Like, these are my people and these are not my people. Uh, and, and so it would have been very obvious to her that this, this wasn't an Egyptian. But she took pity on him. Verse 7 says, then his sister, so our sidekick Miriam, said to Pharaoh's daughter, which is crazy, like, girl, you are risking your life talking to this woman while she's bathing. Shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Verse 8, and Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. So the girl, and um, again, if you look at the Hebrew here, the word is Alma. Um, and this is what I love about our Miriam, because that means she would have been anywhere within the, the 10 to 13 years of age range. So, so she's possibly the oldest um, of, of her siblings, like certainly Aaron's the, the middle child and Moses is 
is the baby. This word means young woman of a, a marriageable age in their culture and context. So that means she's at least a decade older than Moses. It's going to be important later. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child away and nurse him for me. And I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. When the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter. And he, Moses, became her son. She named him Moses because, these are her words, I drew him out of the water. And that's what that word Moses means, to be drawn out. And so Moses is now being raised in the first family of the global superpower on the planet. Uh, Moses would have been well-educated, um, but he would have had a little bit of an identity crisis. He's like, I'm, I'm, I'm a Hebrew, but I'm Egyptian. And, and so as he's growing up and understanding the world and getting taught about their gods and their culture and their language and their military tactics and how to govern and, and, and their economy, he's learning all these things all at the same time, watching his own people suffer. And he probably misses his mom and, and, and his siblings. And so he's wrestling with what, what this looks like. And at the same time, he never forgot who he was. I wonder if those times when Moses was nursing, if his mom didn't just speak life over him, um, reminding him of his identity, reminding of his destiny, that he's made on purpose for a purpose, that, that he was spared, that of all the, the kids that were lost that day, God protected Moses. And he did it for a purpose. And so now this is beginning to stir up in Moses, not forgetting who he was. And that's later going to be confirmed by an encounter with God in a burning bush. Again, what a great day in church. (laughs) And all of this, again, if we just jump back to, to what just took place in the Nile, all of this was possible because Miriam had the courage to, to stand by, but also the courage to speak up and act when it was necessary. So many opportunities for Moses' young life to be snuffed out. Now, again, Moses ain't perfect. Um, So there there are some bumps in the road for our hero Moses. Um, We know he tried to take hold of his destiny by his own strength. Um, Young people, that's never a good idea. Uh, I know the world teaches you to, like, go make an opportunity. Um, I'm just, I only got 36 years of experience. So there's some other people in the room who could tell you better. Uh, But it it don't work. Uh, It it doesn't work that way. It's better to obediently walk into the promises that God has for your life. So Moses tries to start the rebellion. He sees an Egyptian kill a Hebrew, and therefore he kills the Egyptian. But then the Hebrews saw it, and they're like, hey, bro, I know you think you're one of us, but we don't accept you. So now, out of fear, because he's like, wait, this is supposed to be the army that I was going to raise up to rebel against the government, and they don't trust me. That means the government's going to kill me because I committed a crime. So Moses flees into exile. And not only that, again, Egyptian culture. So he grew up hating shepherds. That was like the worst job you could have in their culture. And now he has to go and spend 40 years as a shepherd. And worse, (laughs) they were his father-in-law's sheep. Uh, So he's not even taking care of his own sheep. It's humble. He went from, from being a prince of Egypt, first family being humbled by God. Fast forward, we get the burning bush experience. We get Moses being reunited with his brother Aaron. Um, and that's where Moses has the, the moment where he's like, God, I don't, I don't speak well. You know, there's a cultural disconnect between me and the people you've called me to lead. So can you get my brother to speak to them? Because he connects a little bit better. And God tells Moses, well, I'll be, you'll be like God to him and, and he'll be the spokesman. So you tell him what to say. And so they step in and you guys have seen the movies, like, let my people go. And God rains down 10 plagues that utterly destroy a global superpower, um, personally attacking all of their pantheon of gods, uh, reminding them that there's one God, and all names bow to the name of Jesus. And so Egypt is defeated at the Red Sea, and now is the time to celebrate. Our God is faithful, and who do we see other than our sidekick of the day step up and lead God's people in worship? Of course, it's Miriam. Let's jump to Exodus chapter 15, verse 20. Then Miriam the prophetess, 
So she, she didn't got her little job description. Like she didn't came up in the world longer the days of us looking at, you know, baby bro along the Nile. Like God picked me too. Like I got some things. I got some gifts. The prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a tambourine in her hand and all the women went out after her with tambourines and dancing. And Miriam sang to them, sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider has been thrown into the sea. Now, it's interesting she's listed as a prophetess here. Um, it's like the first time we actually see that title. Um, now, God does speak through people, um, and that is a prophetic gifting. We believe that gift is released within the body. Like, all the graces of Jesus are, like, available for his church. Uh, but she's, like, the first person in Scripture that we see with, like, this, this nomenclature, this title of prophetess. And this is big and unique. I mean, she occupies this, this role of spiritual leadership as the children of Israel are being formed into a nation. And what I love about this is it just reminds me of the, the grace from God. Like, God gives all of us gifts. Like, God will give you some things that you don't ask for. He's already deposited that in you. And it's our jobs to discover those gifts and then to simply step up and lead as he prompts us. And this leadership was recognized in her time and long after. Uh, we find this in... Micah. So again, Micah, another prophet. Look at what he has to say as he's prophesying, as he's speaking on behalf of God. Micah chapter 6, verse 4, he says, For I brought you, this is God speaking through the prophet, I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery, and I set before you Moses and Aaron and Miriam. So as Micah prophesied, he recalled that Miriam was standing by her brothers as a leader for God's people. She stood up and she spoke up. <laughs> That's kind of that prophetic bent, like the, 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 the prophet in you, like some of y'all know this person who always feels the need to be like, this is unjust or this is wrong. This needs to be fixed. Like you love those people, but then you don't like those people. You know what I'm talking about? Like some of y'all, some of y'all, that's you. So. <laughs> but not everything is great in Miriam's story. Um, she's a human being. Um, and, and last time I checked, there was only one perfect person, and his name is Jesus. Um, and so the Bible always tells the truth. Uh, the Bible's going to show you the good, the bad, the ugly. It doesn't gloss over the mistakes of leaders. Like, if you want to look at leadership failure, just look at any person in the Bible you see not named Jesus. That's how we end up with a person described as a man after God's own heart who gets one of his closest troops' wife pregnant uh, while he's deployed, and then he calls them back to try to cover it up, but then the guy's so full of integrity, he's like, nope, I can't do this. My troops are out there in the tents. I'm, I, I need to go back. And to cover it up, he has the dude killed. That's David. So we know. Miriam is flawed and, and sinful, just like the rest of us. And so what we might learn, I believe our most powerful lesson that, that we can learn from this spot is actually from Miriam's failure. And so I want to give you an equation. I want to make this simple. Again, y'all know I'm a practical preacher, so I always want to arm you with something that you can take home and apply to your context. Here's the formula. The presence is greater than the power and the position. Here's what I mean. The presence of God, again, I love that man of music, they led us into this song called Nothing Else, and I also hate them because they know that song makes me cry every time I hear it. <laughs> because as a pastor, y'all, I, I have charts and plans and data and strategy to see this church grow and advance the kingdom. I want to see all lost people, but there's a little part of me that wants to be like, yeah, I did that. It's true. And then God simply reminds me, he's like, hey, Riley, that's, that's fun. And I, and I have that available for you. I mean, I, I created you for that, but don't, don't, don't miss dad. Don't, don't, don't miss the relationship with me chasing the, the things that I made for you. Like, don't, don't get lost in that stuff. Don't get caught up in a position. Like, man, if I just had this title, then I could be who God says I am. Really? Why don't you? Just, I mean, being is an identity thing. So if he's called you to pastor, don't wait till someone calls you pastor to start pastoring. If he's called you to preach, don't, don't wait till someone ordains you as a preacher to start preaching. Like, be faithful and be addicted to his presence. 
Go where God is. Don't get caught up in, in the power. Because one of the most sobering things I read in Scripture, Ezekiel's talking about the Levites. And, and their job was to serve in the temple, to serve in the presence of God. And they didn't obey, so they did it the wrong way. They were very particular in how you have to encounter the presence of God. And because they made strange fire, strange offering to God, he says, you know what? You're still going to serve me. You'll still do your job. You'll still be able to preach a great message. You'll still be able to lay hands on people. They'll get healed. You'll still be able to prophesy. You just won't experience my presence. No, that, that's the moment where we, we see it, like Cain and Abel in, in that narrative where Cain is cast out of God's presence. And he's like, this is too much to handle. The presence is everything. It's greater than anything you could ever want. And trust me, like some of us, I, I, I wrestle with it too. We got some codependency. Some of us love serving other people because it makes us feel good. I understand that. It's not better than the presence of God. Some of us worship, worship. It's got to be the right song, the right set list, the right genre in order for me to experience God. Really? No, sometimes we just are distracted. We're focused on the wrong things. I was actually challenged by um, a member of Man of Church. He, he's down in Fayetteville. Uh, some of you guys know him. Uh, he actually leads the largest independent grocer in the country. Um, so like Walmart showed up next to this guy's grocery store and he forced Walmart to move away because they were just killing it with their customer service. So that is impressive. And so this guy, he makes a huge contribution to our church. He's like, hey, I want to do a chicken giveaway. Like this is during the pandemic. So we we're like, how can we serve people? How can we love people? Give them chicken. Like, I mean, come on, like praise, <laughs> praise God. Like, please give me some free chicken from the man of church. So anyways, so I'm out there and to my surprise, this guy who runs this chain of grocery stores is right there in the trenches with, with his sleeves rolled up and he's slinging chicken in cars right with me. So, so we're getting to talking and he's like, hey, Pastor Ryan, I got a question for you. And I'm like, hold on, I can't talk. and sling chicken at the same time. <laughs> and he asked me, so he's like, which one of your kids is your favorite? And I'm like, hold on now, you're getting a little too much of my business. <laughs> but when he asked that, of course, I said the, the right pastoral thing. All of them are my favorite. You know, God's no respecter of person. I love all my children. He's like, stop lying to me. Which one's your favorite? <laughs> so now I'm like, man, this is my impact giving. So I got I to make, sure, make sure I handle this conversation appropriately. And I was like, man, if I'm being honest, um, at the time, it, it was, we only had three children. Um, and it was Tierra. Um, and I was honest. I was like, yeah, that, that girl. And he's like, why is she your favorite? And I sat there and I really thought about it. I'm like, you know, like my oldest, like he just kind of wants me when he needs the credit card or, you know, need me to give him the Wi-Fi password. And once he gets it, then he's like, I'm out. Thanks for the gift, Dad. Um, and then like my middle child, like he's kind of the same season where he's discovered that, man, Dad can give me stuff and I can get what I want by just briefly interacting with Dad. Um, <laughs> And so he'll, he'll work the system. And then he, once he gets what he wants, he's out. I got to go outside and play. I'm doing my thing. All right, cool. Um, but that girl, uh, there, there were times where she's like, Daddy, I love you. <laughs> and I'm like, what do you want? I want you, Daddy. And she just grabbed me by the beard, and Dan, it was over. Like, it was over at that moment. I'm like, girl, I will give you whatever you want. I know it's going to hurt me when she's a teenager. <laughs> All that to say is, through that conversation, he's like, the kid that wants your presence the most is your favorite. Um, so that's for somebody. Anyways, back to the text. Numbers chapter 12. We got to land this plane on time. Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he married. Now remember, they're in a tribe. They're in a family. They're in a demographic and ethno-linguistic linguistic people group. There are, are culture clashes. So this woman from Cush, which have been like, um, you know, kind of like in a Nubian area. So she's probably a little, little brown-skinned girl. Um, <laughs> Miriam suddenly has a problem with it. Now, Moses has been married to her for like 40 years. So father-in-law is sheep, her dad. So again, a little bit of context here. Miriam now has a problem with this Cushite woman because remember, our dad was a Levite and he married our mom who's a Levite and we're God's chosen people. And that means that we have to be set apart and we can't invite these other people into our family. Moses, what have you done? And they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Because um, I'm the prophetess. I, I can hear from God. Like, he speaks to me. I have a Bible. Like, I didn't go to seminary, but I, I hear from God too. Has he not spoken through us also? And again, if we're reading this in Hebrew, we'll notice that the verbs here have the feminine ending. <laughs> um, 
So Miriam is, is leading the charge in this accusation against our hero Moses. And again, I picture the classic sibling rivalry here where you have the older sister go get the middle brother and like, Aaron, we have to say something to him. Again, that's the prophetic bit. It's a good thing to call things out when you have context. <laughs> but when you don't understand, when you can't speak to it, again, we're just going to see a confrontation that comes from this. So now she's squared off with Moses, finger pointing in his face, and you have a Aaron there who's agreeing with her, just not bold enough to say it. So then we get back to our verse, and the Lord heard it. Now when the man Moses was, or now the man Moses was very meek, humble, more than all the people who were on the face of the earth. Let that sink in. Like if you want to be known for something, like if you want a title, let it be most humble person on the planet. That's the person who needs God's presence. That's the person who's desperate for God. When you realize that, yeah, I had a position, I had power when I was a prince in Egypt, but that doesn't compare to this burning bush. That changed Moses. That allowed Moses, that empowered him to go and speak to Pharaoh and demand, you're going to let my people go. Like, y'all know how intimidated Pharaoh must have been? To speak to him that way, Moses could have been killed on the spot. His bodyguards, security details, right there. No, this man, he, he met with God. He knew that he was going to be successful. Come out. Suddenly the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, come out, you three, to the tent of meeting. So again, (laughs) dad showed up. And the three came out, and the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tent and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forward. And he said, hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision Um, I speak with him in a dream. So again, Miriam's a prophetess, and Aaron, he's a high priest, so he would have flowed in that space. Like, he knows how to hear from God. He he ministers to God. He's had these dreams. He's he's heard this stuff as as God speaks to him in visions. And Moses certainly is a prophet, so they all identify with this. There's a bunch of gifting in this family. But then God goes one step further in verse 7. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful, which means that he has pursuit. He, he, he pursues the presence of God. And then there's obedience. So if you're following God, okay, we talked about this last week when we were studying another, another Mary. You're going to be found at his feet. So this is what I say to my people who say, I have a relationship with God. I just don't do church. He's married to the church. So you're not going to tell me that you want to spend time with Riley and not spend time with Tasha. I'm sorry, you get both of us. And so if you really are pursuing the presence of Jesus, you're going to find yourself with the church. I'm just saying, like, that's how it works. He's faithful. He obeys. And all my house, so of all God's people, Moses is faithful. When I speak to him, it's mouth to mouth. Another translation, face to face. And not in riddles. And he beholds the form of the Lord. This actually challenges me with how I talk about leaders. Um, And again, this doesn't have to be like church leaders. Like uh, some of us are under some form of authority. Um, I'm assuming. (laughs) Whether that be parents, uh, whether that be teachers, whether that be supervisors, managers, uh, bosses, like chain of command. There's authority around you because that's how our God like organizes things. And because of that, Because of what we see here, it lets me know that I don't always understand the context. I don't understand that weight of authority. And so maybe I should just be quiet and let God be God. And if we examine the text a little bit further, if we go to Exodus chapter 33, we see another moment where now Aaron messes up. So Moses goes up on a mountain to meet with God. And the rest of the children of Israel decide to throw a party. And um, somehow they end up worshiping a calf. It was a crazy time. Like, we don't know what happened. Even Aaron says, look, Moses, I just threw the gold in the fire, and the calf came out. Like, it was crazy. (laughs) And in that moment, God offers a deal to Moses. He's like, look, Moses, I'm going to kill all these people. (laughs) Like, they are terrible. Like, I I can't do this with them. I'm going to start over with you. Instead of the children of Israel, what if we had the children of Moses? I'll make a new covenant with you, Moses. It'll be fantastic. And what Moses says is, is God, what will 
the nations? What will the people outside of our spiritual family say about you if you couldn't fulfill your promise, if, if you couldn't lead this stiff-necked people into the promised land? That actually challenges the way I pray sometimes. Instead of just simply praying for God to do something for my name's sake, I ask Jesus to do things for his name's sake. God, what will they say about you if my marriage is a train wreck? God, what will they say about you if, if I can't mend this broken relationship? God, what will they say about you if I lose this job or lose this opportunity or lose this child? Do it for your name's sake. And this moves God. So God offers Moses another deal. He's like, okay, I, I, I like the spunk kid. You, you, you're on the right track. Here's what I'll do. Um, I'm going to send an angel. Um, Anything you want, anything you need, the angel's got you. He, he's good for it. I give him a blank check. The angel will lead you and your people into the promised land. That sounds like a good deal. Like, I, I think if we're truly being honest, who wouldn't want a blank check from God? Ask me anything. I'll give it to you. And Moses, what he says in that moment, he's like, God, I don't want an angel. I, I looked at you when I stared into that burning bush. And if you're not going to lead us into the promised land, then I'm not going. Because Moses loved the presence of God. And look at what God says. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? You don't know our relationship. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. When the cloud removed from over the tent, behold, Miriam was leprous like snow. And Aaron turned toward Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said to Moses, O oh my Lord, do not punish us because we have done foolishly and have sinned. Let her not be as one dead whose flesh is half eaten away when it comes out of his mother's womb. See, when I, when I look at this portion of the text, I ask the question, like, why does Miriam get leprosy and Aaron doesn't? Um, and so I started looking through Logos, which is like some software to Bible study. I highly recommend it. It's expensive, though. But um, I actually found a couple scholars who made the commentary that because of his priestly role, because he had this job where he needed to maintain his purity, um, that if he would have been leprous, then he would have been disqualified from being able to do his ministry. But uh, that, that, that didn't sit well with me. It doesn't seem like the character of our God. I, I don't think he says, hey, you're too important to fail. No, I think if we just look at the text for what it says, look at how quickly Aaron repents. And, and remember, Miriam's the catalyst for this complaint against Moses, but Aaron immediately repented. And look at Moses in verse 13. And Moses cried to the Lord, Oh God, please heal her, please. But the Lord said to Moses, If her father had but spit in her face, she, should she not be shamed for seven days? Let her be shut outside the camp for seven days, and after that she may be brought in again. So Miriam was shut outside the camp seven days, and the people did not set out on the march till Miriam was brought in again. What I love about verse 15 is that even in her dismay, um, even in her leadership failure, Miriam was still honored by God's people. Like, I, I think it's easy to throw rocks and hide your hand. I, I think it's easy that when you read something in a headline or something on the internet and you see this pastor, oh, look what they're caught up in. Like, it's, it's easy to do that. But for a moment, I want us to focus on the main idea here. See, Miriam and Ariam, they were caught up in their position and their power, what came along with a title, what came along with this influence. But Moses focused on the presence of God. And I think when the people of God are focused on the presence of God, then we create a safe place for people to be restored. We create a safe community for people to be brought back in. And again, I just want to help some of us be careful with making success your metric for godliness. Just follow the presence. Just do what he tells you to do. And I believe if we do that, man, a family, we can change the world. So do me a favor, bow your head. I'd love to pray for you. Man, God, I love, I love that we had this opportunity to learn from some everyday people, uh, people who do the practical, who have some gifts, have some talents, have some resources. But more than anything, God, we have you. Uh, we get to do life with you. You talk to us. Uh, you call us friends, so we're not settling for this, this slavery in Egypt. We're not settling for a position or a title. We're not, we're not chasing that, God. I'm, I'm chasing the presence. 
God, speak to us and give us the, the faith and the, the courage to obey you. Just like Miriam, she had courage. She was bold. She would speak out. She would step into dangerous situations. God, may we be bold like Miriam. But at the same time, God, may we not fall in love with the, the cool things we get to do. May we not look down at people. May we not bring accusations without context. God, may we be a church that asks questions until it gets uncomfortable. That we want to know what's really going on. And most importantly, God, that we would know what you're doing in the lives of those around us. So Holy Spirit, would you fill us afresh? In this moment, would you deposit in us a grace that we don't naturally have? But because of you, because of your presence, God, we get to be your hands and feet to a world that desperately needs Jesus. So God, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now do me a moment. Keep your head bowed. Just one more moment, one more prayer. Maybe in your, your spirit, again, you may not even know the Bible or, you know, I don't know, maybe you're just invited here and, and they were singing and you had free coffee and it was cool and um, then you start getting emotional and stuff. And, and in your spirit, in, in, inside of you, you, you've sensed that I kind of feel like Miriam where I'm outside, um, where, where I'm alone and, and, and I'm not invited. Can I encourage you? Like, you don't have to believe to belong. But oh, do we wait for that moment of belief? Oh, do we savor that moment that you would put your faith and trust in Jesus? See, we all have a problem. We all do this thing called life where we're doing it in our own strength, in our own power. And we're trying to be good enough, but the reality is we just ain't good enough. But Jesus is. He's amazing. In fact, the Bible teaches us that while we were sinners, we were enemies of God. And in that place, he chose to die for us. Because it takes that type of grace, that type of love to bring people into the family. And so if that's you, if you sense what God has done for you and, and you want to step into his family, I just want to encourage you right now in this moment of privacy and concentration, every head bowed, every eye closed. If you want to make a decision to make Jesus your Lord and Savior, m- maybe you're the one who walked away and this is your, hey, I'm, I'm coming back. I'm coming back in the camp. Would you do me a huge favor? Would you lift your hand where I can see it? That way I know who I'm praying with. And again, our intent is never to sing anyone out. We don't want to embarrass you. I just want to encourage you to make an outward expression of what God is already doing in your heart. If you're watching this online, just let us know in the chat section right there. And we would love to see what we can do to equip you as a local church to help you take some next steps in your journey with Jesus. Anybody else in the room who wants to get on this prayer, now's your moment. I'd love to pray for you. And like I said, we're not going to embarrass you. So what we're going to do is we're all going to pray this prayer together. So church, if you repeat after me and say, Jesus, thank you for loving me. I'm a sinner, but I confess my sin. I repent and I choose you. Come into my heart. Be the Lord of my life. And today is a new day. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, church. There's a party in heaven for anyone who prayed that prayer. Man, God is doing some cool.